the advancement in the biosecurity and systems that exist today on the breeding herds um, and, you know, growing replacement gilts and, of course, the boar studs and all that kind of stuff is it's that's being implemented day in, day out in this country across masses is extraordinary. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast, and it is my great honor to welcome you to our special edition 100th episode of the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. For the 100th episode, I want to thank uh, the team that produces this podcast for giving me a little flexibility to invite somebody that I think is going to be an amazing guest and to uh, have a little more free-flowing discussion and a little longer form podcast. And without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Roger Main to officially join me as our guest on the 100th episode. Roger, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us here today. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Clayton. Appreciate the invitation and opportunity to be here. For anybody that hasn't met Dr. Main, Roger's the director of the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at Iowa State University. Um, but Roger, you've had uh, a, a career that has had different roles, different sectors of the industry, different educational experiences. And even for folks that have known you for the last decade, they may not know your, your entire background. So if you would, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and, and kind of how you get a view of the industry because of the unique set of lenses that you've seen the industry through throughout your career. Sure, Clayton. Appreciate that. And um, so, yeah, I, I uh, grew up actually in, uh, in a farm there in West Central Illinois, uh, just out in a little town called Altona, right outside of Galesburg, and, and still have a lot of my family and cousins and so on that farm that farm and um, and uh, raise livestock and, and uh, grow crops in that region of the world. Uh, came out here to, to Ames, to Iowa State to go to school, went to undergrad and then uh, vet school here. And then um, uh, out of school, uh, went to work, uh, still was located here in central Iowa, uh, but for what was uh, the Murphy Farms operation was just really expanding into the Midwest at that time. And one of my key principal mentors was a gentleman named Howard Hill, who I had worked for. I'd worked at the lab all through school and I worked for Howard uh, here at the lab and then on, on some of his uh, personal farms in the area. And um, and he would had went to work for Murphy Farms at that time. And that that uh, business was just expanding out into the Midwest at that time. And this would have been in like the mid 90s. OK. And um, and so went to work there with what they called their Western operations. And really when I started with that, that uh, operation, it was about 30,000 sows, something like that, that were located in uh, uh, Southwest Missouri with pigs coming up to Iowa uh, to be finished and, uh, and uh, worked with that group and had a great experience through the Murphy and then Murphy Brown days and, and, then, and, then, uh, and, and then later Smithfield. Uh, that was about a 13 year journey very rewarding, was always housed out of central Iowa. I think it started, it was like 30,000 sows. And when I transitioned to my current role here at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab about 15 years ago, it was about 450,000 sows, something like that, right? So there's been a lot of growth and change. I am in uh, just tremendous uh, experiences uh, up and down through that. And, um, and along that way, uh, during that period of time, it was a cooperative agreement actually with my employer there, uh, Murphy Brown, and then uh, Kansas State, and then actually some support from uh, uh, the group out of Pipestone uh, that was supporting uh, some research fellows. And uh, my, uh, my uh, principal advisor was uh, Steve Dreeks, and really that really kind of then the entirety of that K-State nutrition team, my wife and I, Marcy, we moved down there for three years um, and then came back, and uh, that was kind of an agreed upon uh, opportunity and just can't say enough good about that um, and then say so kind of continued in that and really my roles within that uh, organization uh, you know started out originally more on the health side really focused on that then took on uh, both production and health responsibilities over the course of that time 
um, and then also oversaw the the multiplication, uh, meaning the, the breeding stock replacement and so on, as well as their applied research efforts again for the stuff that was essentially located in the west of the uh, the western U.S. You might say Midwest and then western U.S. Basically everything that was not in the Carolinas, and just had some great bosses there and great leaders that I learned from a lot. And uh, so with that opportunity there, then I had always had such a really significant respect for the role that the veterinary diagnostic lab played of kind of as a, I call it kind of a non-biased uh, partner, basically an ex I've always viewed the, viewed the lab as kind of like an extension of your practice, um, extension support pra of your practice or partnering your practice of just trying to do hopefully some good uh, to, to enhance the, the health of the animals kind of that you're trying to, to serve and, 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 and uh, do the best you can. And so there was an opportunity to come here. Uh, uh, Dr. Pat Halber had reached out to me and, and again, a great mentor there. And it said, you know, there's an opportunity here. And then I kind of looked at that and it was an opportunity to, to uh, be able to stay here in central Iowa where I lived, you know, since the, actually the late eighties and, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe, have the opportunity to contribute in a different way uh, than I had been in my my uh, my place of business there, and that's been a great opportunity. Fifteen years now, and uh, as Clayton, you may know, and some of the audience may know, our team here at the lab. It's a team of about 180 some folks um, serving. You know, the principal focus is food, animal, agriculture, and the largest piece of that, uh, north of 80 some percent of that, is is serving. Uh, U.S. Uh, swine producers and swine veterinarians uh, in Iowa and really uh, throughout the country. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed that that opportunity uh, over the course of these past years. So that's a bit about my background. At Essential Ag, pork production is our life. We understand the real world challenges producers face, and that is why we strive to bring research driven solutions to the industry. The team at Essential Ag is working hard every day to find and deliver innovative technologies to you because we are passionate about solving your problems. Fantastic, Roger. You have seen the industry evolve through the years, and I'm going to put words in your mouth, but I think they're safe to say from A-frame huts and dirt lots, you know, natural breeding to artificial insemination, right? Moving pigs into confinement, um, new packing plant construction, new farm construction. The industry, uh, I don't know a lot about other industries, but it's hard for me to imagine another industry that has evolved with that level of change in really what has been like several decades, right? Um, now, with every evolution, there's some good and some bad. Um, what's your take on today's industry as you look through that, that lens of time, right? Um, how has the industry evolved in a positive way that we should be proud of and continue to evolve? And then vice versa for the U.S. industry, like what are some evolutions that maybe have been the one step backwards, right? Two steps forward, but one step backward. Things that are either blind spots that we don't know are a problem today or things that are real problems and maybe we know about them, but like we got to come up with better plans for how to fix them. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start with maybe the, the, the responding to the first part of that question and then maybe prompt me for the second again. But I think the... The, the thing about, I think the biggest evolution in the industry has been, uh, from my perspective, the, the, the principal theme has been continuous improvement and a drive for how do we continue to, to, to uh, learn and, and better, uh, you know, the health and well-being and, and the productivity and the costs associated with raising such, such pigs. And... And it's been an effort to, uh, I think, I mean, it's quite a story if you look at the productivity, right? And, and productivity has been a key for helping make, you know, raising a pork uh, a cost-effective enterprise uh, in this country uh, for a long time. And, 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 of course, the major, if you look at the gross in productivity per sow, you know, of net pounds of animals that are being sold, the amount of pork being sold per sow on foot or on, on inventory, um, it's, it's quite a story, both in the productivity uh, of continued improvements in the breeding herd, 
and then of course the 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 the, the impact on the growing pig, uh, and and especially with the slaughter weight uh, that you know of the size of these animals that are being harvested today, obviously it's been uh, quite a transformation. But I think the thing that I really uh, appreciate and I just thoroughly enjoy all the opportunities I've had to work in this pork industry is it's a I think it's a great group of people and they're passionate about what they do and and and, and passionate about continuous improvement and lots of mo quote modernization adapting to ne new technologies how do we make better mouse traps you know to do what we do and I think to me that's that's been a fun a fun piece of it because it's like you're truly working with very substantive and significant biological systems, right? Of how do we, we uh, you know, uh, play a role in uh, producing a, a safe and a, an abundant uh, food supply with our core centered here on uh, safe and affordable and, and uh, pork and, and doing that a way that can, you know, nourish people both locally and, and, and abroad. And um, so that's, I think, the part, of, from my perspective, the, the, the principal theme has been continuous improvement. Yeah. Well, I think you did a great job of highlighting um, a, a strength that we have as an industry, our ability to produce more pounds of pork from the same number of sows that we've had for a long, long time. I think any, any industry would certainly look at that as a success story. What about, Roger, the, uh, the weaknesses side or, or the threat side? What are the things that um, are a problem that we need to be aware of and fix today and or we need to have on our radar because they could become problems for us in the future? Sure. So I'll, I'll start with, I think, one of the uh, I wanted to, you know, first, I think, acknowledge uh, of that the, uh, you know, of the substantive economic um, challenges. Uh, if not crisis, you know, that, that uh, of these uh, challenging economic conditions of the greater U.S. pork industry has experienced, you know, now for nearly the last almost two years. Uh, with hopefully some, some brighter uh, sun on the horizon here. But it's, you know, I want to acknowledge that's, that's obviously been very substantive and significant to, to all aspects of the U.S. pork industry. Um, I think as it relates to, you know, macro level challenges, um, I, I do believe that um, it's it's always not a bad idea at all to uh, look to our peers and others, uh, uh, both within and across industries to say, what can we learn from them? What can we learn from them? And how can we apply that in our individual place of business uh, and or, or industry as a whole? And I think um, one of the, the challenges, of course, has been, um, I think, a, a real challenge of moving the demand needle domestically, okay? And I think that's not a new thing, uh, right? Um, and, and I think, but I do think that is a macro level thing that there's going to be, need to be opportunities to say how, uh, we've done a great job of continuing to expand the export market of the U.S. pork industry, right? That's been a tremendous ride and, and needle that's moved really since the, the mid 90s, you know, and, and and that's created a lot of opportunities here at home for, for something that we can do very well in, in comparison, especially from a cost standpoint relative to the rest of the world. Um, but I think uh, there's also to see is what can we learn and, and maybe uh, I think we, we have to look at the poultry a bit about that, uh, specifically as it relates to uh, um, how can we, what opportunities are there to, to, uh, to uh, maybe move the needle as it relates to domestic uh, consumption and demand uh, for the product um, domestically? Um, and obviously the poultry have quite a different story of, of poultry consumption, um, you know, over the, these past uh, 40 years. Uh, and, uh, and I think probably there's some nuggets on demand of how do we continue to, 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 look, to look at that. And, and I think there's opportunity there. That is very much out of my scope of area of influence and, and any expertise, um, but I think it is something, it's an opportunity. I think the things that I, you know, deal with, and, and Clayton, I know you, you, you as well, being in the veterinary field, um, is, of course, um, the, the role and impact of, of infectious diseases um, and their impact on 
um, are the competitiveness of our of our industry, uh, the uh, productivity of our industry, and so on. Um, and and I think that's an area where I think big picture is you know we've really mastered I think the ability to say diagnose, um, monitor, and or readily eliminate um, infectious diseases of high consequence from individual farms. I think we're really good at that, and um, and uh, and uh, and we can do that readily well at breeding. You know, individual farms, individual premises, uh, maybe even groups of farms, uh, and or small regions or pods of farms that are that are under maybe a common uh, set of management influences and in geographical regions. Um, but I think the the uh, these uh, the accumulation of some of these viruses in particular that really when I would have, you know, started, of course, out of, you know, I started out of school, we were, you know, in the throes of the pseudorabies thing, and, and that was a big thing. Um, first was just really getting its wheels underneath of it. Um, but, you know, uh, we got rid of the pseudorabies in the late 90s, early 2000s, finished that off. And then, um, but some of these accumulation of some of these viral diseases um, that have had the uh, have that uh, have and are having a very significant thing uh, or impact on on the on productivity and, and maybe and livability. I think livability, you know, livability is a big thing, and I think we have a lot of opportunities in that space. And unquestionably, the the impact of the virus of, of some of these more substantive viruses, namely PERS, namely PDV, um, that are having a very significant and ongoing and very, you know, you could arguably on a macro level, pretty predictable impact on our U.S. Uh, pork industry and pork production. And, and I think that um, thing about saying, well, going back to learning from our peers, how can we learn from our peers and maybe peer industries about how they conquered some similar challenges and going back to the major strengths of, on the health side, which is, again, that's the space we play in, you know, um, have that opportunity, has been that, boy, we're really good at identifying and diagnosing and, 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 and getting rid of these diseases from individual farms. But what's a real challenge is to be able to take that and, ex and, and expand those successes um, across areas and regions on a macro level way, uh, because you get into some of these is that we're only as good as our neighbor, you know, some of that. And, uh, and I think that, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a real opportunity. Um, and so I, I think that, and as it relates to end game, you know, uh, birth to market livability, um, I, th I think those are in the role the infectious diseases are playing or continue to play in that. I think I think it's a great opportunity um, as we look forward again, kind of in that theme of trying to continually improve what we do here. Yeah, Roger, you mentioned and I think very correctly that um, individual farms, individual producers, small regions, they can control disease to include eliminating disease very effectively. PERS, PED, all the domestic diseases we deal with today, um, if you have control over a geography, you can control your destiny. Um, do you, you also highlighted that we, keep, we don't do that at the industry level. We, we don't slash can't today. And I guess that's my question for you. Is it we don't? Do we have the tools that we need to, to do that today, right? Is it just we don't use them to control it at the industry level? Or is it a can't situation? Can, can we just truly, there, there is no one um, uh, way in which we can control the domestic disease and we need additional resources. We need new technology, new resources, new tools, something else to be able to do what we can do in small regions or individual farms production systems and expand that across the entire U.S. production system. Any thoughts on that? I mean, is it possible with today's tools or no? Like we need new stuff to be able to pull that off. Well, I'm an optimist. And I, and I, and I, and I, I, uh, that's good, Roger. The world has enough pessimists already. Right. Right. And, and I, I absolutely think yes. And, and 
the and like the industry has a long way or a long history of saying solving problems you know and and ultimately uh things that make sense will make sense and and that will drive solutions and and so on and so forth and i think one of the things that as it relates to the health stuff and especially these viruses that can you know move more readily between farms and, and, and so on and so forth is that it has to be involved with some sort of effort to move together. Okay. And, and the pseudorabies eradication was, a, you know, I learned a lot from that experience and so on uh, be, because it was like, you know, and, and the, you know, until in different disease vaccine was great. That's all good stuff. Right. But, and, but, even with all of that, until you had a, an effort that included all aspects of the industry to move that needle forward, and it didn't happen overnight, you know, um, but until you have that of we can work together, we can move towards, and you have a common end, you know, um, it, just, it just showed to me that experience was the power and the, the necessity of people working together. And, and I'll get and one like classic take home thing from that experience is, you know, I live here today in, in, in Iowa, the center of, you know, pig uh, USA and uh, lots of growing animals, lots of growing pigs and so on. And, and of course, in, in the, the industry is only, you know, Iowa has only become more and more growing pigs since that time it was eliminated, but it doesn't look a lot different than it did then. I mean, um, but, but I would use this. It was like, we had this thing, it was going on forever and ever. And then it became a thing of like, okay. Cause the solution to that one was everybody's got to vaccinate. Okay. And it was very aggressive on the immunity side and the immunity side that was being executed actually had very little to do with protecting the health of those growing pigs from like, you know, avert disease. It had everything to do with mitigating shedding and finishing. 100%. And these biocontainment, 100%. It wasn't eliminated on biosecurity. It was eliminated on biocontainment via immunity. And, 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 and it was boost in the pigs that were in these higher risk regions it involved even boostering these pigs, you know, mid finishing or, you know, that type of thing. And it was all about mitigating shedding in those finishing pigs through slaughter, right? And when that happened and it became, you know, okay, now we're, we're going to all do it. It was gone in 18 months, you know? And so all that showed me was not necessarily about that given disease and that given approach, but it, but it was the power of we're working together, you know, towards a common end. And we had the tools and we had the tools to predictably get the job done. And, and, and some of those tools obviously don't exist for some of the pathogens we had, but, but nonetheless, it was really, I think the folks work, you know, it was an effort to say we're working together and it was the industry state and federal partners say, how do we get this done? And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and like everything else, it was like coordinated, but the, the work was being done locally and, 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 and there was a lot of learnings from, when it started to when it ended. And, but I think there's some nuggets we can learn from that. And, and the other thing I would say is um, kind of related to just those sort of macro level opportunities. I mean, and things that have changed over time is the advancement in the biosecurity and systems that exist today on the breeding herds um, and, you know, growing replacement gilts. And of course the boar studs and all that kind of stuff is it's, that's being implemented day in, day out in this country across masses is extraordinary. It's truly exceptional and truly extraordinary, you know, and, and, and all of that has been ratcheted up in recent decades or past 20 years anyway, uh, because of these viral challenges, namely PERS, then later PDV of how do we keep them out? How do we keep them out? Because we know if we can keep them out and we can produce a, a negative wean pig, then we got something really good we can work with, you know. 
And, um, and that has been ex ex extraordinary. And, and, and the, the resources to all that. And I think, and if it's like, if there's any like macro level opportunity, you would say, um, you know, maybe the, 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 these, uh, growing pigs and, uh, whether that be biocontainment and or biosecurity to some degree, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities in the growing pigs, you know, and, and, it, and if you think even back to the pseudorabies days, the solution, the solution to elimination, it, it, it came from contr controlling shedding and finishing. That's ultimately what really moved it, got it out. That's what moved the needle. Right. And I, I think that there's some lessons from that, um, about how do we think about biocontainment in grow finish, you know, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and we, and, and I think maybe commonly we'd think and lump it into biosecurity, the term biosecurity and growth to finish opportunities there. But, uh, I think that's key. That's true. But I think also this thing about how are, how are we ensuring that the disease that exists in those growing pigs, when they go to, when they're growing, if we can reduce shedding, that's great if they happen to get infected. But then when those pigs go to slaughter, that it's a terminal movement. It's a terminal movement. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and I think that's probably, because to me, it's like all the stuff that's gone on with investments in biosecurity and, and, and sanitation and how do we make all these things better? You know, I would argue one of the biggest opportunities we have is that last phase of production. The last phase of production is that movement of the animals from their, their, uh, their, uh, their finishing site water. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I think that's Clayton, that's, that's the, the focus of that opportunity as it relates to the sanitation of those trailers coming back from the slaughter plants. Um, I, I just think that that's certainly, and that's been not, that's not new news, but I think it's a well-recognized opportunity. I look at an opportunity of something that, you know, uh, as we move forward and progress in time, um, is certainly an opportunity as it relates to um, continuing to improve the overall health and maybe make some of these other opportunities um, possible. Well, there's, um, let's, let's say that biosecurity is risk management, right? There's, and, and biosecurity's goal is to reduce the risk of disease introduction into your farm, new disease, novel disease introduction. There's two ways to improve that risk management, the biosecurity of your finishing farm, let's say. One is to invest in new offices, new, new supply entry rooms, and new loadout chutes, and all those things, right? Air filtration, water treatment, you know, feed mitigation, to make all those big investments that we know how to do. And to your point, we do that in the, at the sow level, generally. Um, but there's 10 finishers for every South farm, right? And uh, the ownership becomes very fragmented and those investments become very complicated. And to be blunt, probably not an easy thing to control at the industry level. But the other way to improve it is just to decrease the contaminated stuff that shows up at the farm. Um, if you don't have risk come to your farm, your biosecurity program is going to look pretty amazing. I think that's what I hear you saying, that if you didn't have to worry about a trailer that was slopping wet with manure and all sorts of pig excretions that just came from the packing plant, if you didn't have to worry about that trailer and how to interact with that trailer at your farm, well, maybe you don't need to change the loadout. Maybe you don't need to change the shower situation. You don't need to spend you know, tens of thousands of dollars on UV chambers and fogging rooms and all those things. I'm paraphrasing, but is, is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I, I, I just think that that, I, I agree that it's that level of, because there could be like some macro level things that this, uh, going back to that, health in a community is cumulative. Right. And it's based on cumulative things that happen and the risks that are associated with those and, and so on and so forth. And 
And I just think as an industry, as we look forward, the continued maturation of how we're managing that risk associated in that final phase, the, the health-related risk, the biocontainment-related risk of that final phase of production, which is the movement of the pig from the finisher to a slaughter, a, a point of uh, concentration, you know, a slaughter facility is a significant thing. And, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, going back to like learning, from, like what, what can we learn? Are we learning from others, peers and so on? We had the uh, opportunity with some uh, peers up here, uh, Daniel Linares and, and Giovanni and, and uh, Trevison and, and Edison Miguel was here the other day. We had the opportunity. It was a co- it was a uh, cooperative thing that was sponsored by the Iowa Pork Producers Association to um, uh, take a look at the the Denmark pork industry. And, and really, what it was focused on was it was saying kind of like a mini case study and, and really just targeted focused on stuff that's like outside the farm gate. Like what can we learn about their systems of health control that are outside the farm gate that are having some impact on the health and productivity of their herd. Okay. And the reason why I think there's some things to learn there. One is the Danes have a lot of pigs. Okay. And they have a lot of, they're in a very high cost uh, area of the world. They have a lot of things there that they're kind of, up against and working through and around, uh, high cost labor, high cost feed, lots of rules, you know, and so on. A lot of, there's no shortage of headwinds there, okay? And in the face of all that, they arguably have the highest productivity, you know, amongst the highest productivity in the world, okay? And so we were saying, well, what is that? How do they do that? And health is obviously a big piece of it, okay? And one of the things that was very interesting there um, um, as it relates to this systems and practices and so on. And it'd be like, oh, it's like, hmm, shocking, but makes sense. Maybe it's like, we ran around and said, okay, you know, there's a lot of stuff about their trucks and what they do and how they wash and all that kind of stuff. And we're like, so we're going around the country and say, well, where in the world do you think the, the most significant truck wash infrastructure in the country in their country, where do you think it exists at? Okay, okay. It's at the slaughter plants. Yeah, the concentration points, the place where you don't mingle pigs. It was the only place that has really, because it's it, they had a different model, but very interesting, because they wash the trucks that are like doing stuff between farms and all that. They wash the trucks out at the farm of delivery. So when you, you deliver, so wherever you deliver the pigs to, when you're done with that, you know, they go rinse out the truck and then they go on to the next place, right? But at the farm of delivery. And and so they really don't have much, like a lot of truck wash infrastructure for that part, right? Well, because, if you don't put infected pigs on the truck and or you don't back up to a chute that's just, you know, totally contaminated with disease, the truck is not a risk. Biosecurity is about novel disease introduction. It's not about preventing your herd from having strep or E. coli, right? Pigs are infected with all those diseases, PCV2, no matter what we do. It's about not dragging that PED in or not dragging that PERS in. Sure. So, yeah, no, I, that's, it would agree and be interesting. But, the, but a macro difference there, just at, the, at, a, at a high level, was the, uh, that I think there's some things to learn there. Is just their investment had been in as it relates to tra- trailer sanitation and so on. And it was really around high quality, um, high volume, high throughput uh, truck wash infrastructure as the as the pl- as the trucks and trailers are leaving the slaughter plant. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance, and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Roger, you uh, uh, have really worked hard and done service to the industry to create the Swine Health Improvement Program. 
you know, and you mentioned before learning from the poultry industry. And I know that was a big foundation of, of your idea and, and really the framework for what's developed there. It's a program that has a lot of name recognition in the industry. Um, and I know you think a lot about this stuff, but, you know, is that a program that can help us with domestic disease, with what we're talking about here? Is it, is it the thing that can bring the resources we have to the, together and help to coordinate towards a common outcome? Assuming we can define one that we want, right? But like, can it be the program that puts the tools together in a way that gives us results we want? Yeah, I sure believe so. And I, I, I say that from the context of just from some, it was like, and I firmly believe it's like, we're all just a victim of our own experiences. Right. And, and, and I say that in that, um, just from those set a lifetime of experiences, I wouldn't be aware of another way, another way to bring, you know, the, the vast diversity of people and opinions and so on and so forth that would exist within the industry together, you know, with, their state and, and industry partners in 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 a, in a in an organized way that is founded on convening such groups to make come together and be a, a democratic process to make decisions that make sense to 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 uh, safeguard and better the health of the said industry that you're working with and and that's where I think is we the whole ship thing you know it's not really my idea. It was, and it's, it's not really a new idea, is that it's just looking to our peers, uh, like the poultry, of how have they, our peers in the U.S., like within the framework of this country, where we are a country of independent states, we're United States, but we're a country of states, and most of all the animal health stuff is state-based, okay? and saying within our country, how has another industry uh, that is obviously very competitive, okay, uh, and uh, has been a very significant competitive. But how have they dealt with some of these health-related challenges in a macro-level way? And and uh, and uh, and so we had done a case study on that, and I didn't really know much about it before then. And it was like, okay, what is it? How does it really work? And and the, and and at its core, what I saw or learned Clayton from doing that was it was like you know. This is a way to bring to create a critical mass of people coming together in an organized way to make decisions. That's a ground up way. And not everybody agrees, you know, but it's 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 a due process. And in the end, it, it's being driven by folks to say we can come together on what we can agree to. Yep. What we can influence, what we can actually do. You bet. And, and actually move something forward. In a, in, a, in, a, in a sustainable way. And, and, and we, the whole thing was, the reason why we started with the, the, this initial certification is centered on this ASF, CSF monitored, uh, being for demonstration of proof of freedom, early detection, and, and uh, supporting continuity of business and a pathway to resumption of international trade outside of control areas, okay, in the event of an introduction. So centered on prevention, Prevention, obviously, from introduction, but then a system for demonstrating inhibitors of freedom of disease and continuity of business outside of control areas. The reason why we started with that was one is we saw there's a huge need, and all it it impacts all aspects of the industry, from large producers to uh, small producers to exhibition producers and the slaughter facilities meat companies okay it impacts all of them because of the macro level impacts that any such of a trade impacting disease would have on interstate movement of animal for growing showing or exhibition national movement of product and so on and so it's just the magnitude of that risk and or consequence of infection and how you return to normalcy after that was so large but it, that's that's a big thing but then also the fact that it in, you have all facets of the industry that care, okay? And that probably the best shot to kind of introduce this concept of what is this thing? How does it work? And, and, and to bring, be able to bring people to the table 
to, to do that. And, and, I, and, and we started that out, Clayton, with just a pilot. It was started in 2020, really, and kind of moving forward in 2021. And, and it started out with the deal, okay, we'll do a two-year pilot. And it was like, did, does anybody care? You know, is there, is there any interest or not? Don't know. You know, it's obviously it, it's something like that can only move forward is if you have a critical mass of interest from the key stakeholders themselves. It's got to be driven by the producers, by the industry collectively. You bet. Because if you don't have that, you don't have anything. And, and so I just, for me and the, the great colleagues, um, Tyler and Giovanni, and, and some really great colleagues within the USDA, uh, Dr. Lisa Rochette has been a big advocate as long as from within UBS for this. Um, and Jack Shear played a significant role early on. And so was just to say, I just viewed it as my, my small piece of it was just to say, well, this is what we learned from this study. And I, because of experiences here at the lab, back before the lab of how does this stuff work? Here's an opportunity. And my only role in it was is to say, well, here's a, here's a framework. If you're, if are people interested and then the industry will figure it, will figure it out for itself. If it's interested and they want to move it, it wants to move forward and we'll have a, a productive life or not. Um, and, and I can tell you was, has been, it's been kind of overwhelming, I would say, as far as the magnitude of interest, and we can see this and now we're saying, okay, yeah, I see it. And now it can be a tool. And I think the thing that was exciting, you know, very interesting and, and uh, rewarding to see, and Clayton, you were at the ASV meeting, the swine, vet, annual swine veterinary meeting we just had here in uh, the end of February, um, in Nashville and, and what was being discussed there is that the was coming from a number of the pre, pre, or veterinary veterinarians and uh, industry participants that were presenting on that meeting. They were talking about health improvement, talking about disease elimination, talk about how do we move some of these things forward, um, enhancing our systems of, of traceability, all those great things, right? And they're very much, I think, connecting that ship, the ship platform uh, can be a tool um, that can be bring, say, a lot of these great ideas and, and uh, technologies and or approaches together into a program. So the ship is just a platform that can be a tool to move such efforts, coordinated efforts that go beyond an individual farm and that go beyond an individual state to move forward. Uh, in a common way, um, the, sh the, the, the ship thing is just a platform, you know, to help pr bring people together to do that. And, you know, so that's that's kind of what that is. And, and there's there's certainly some, I think, some growing interest around, hey, yeah, we understand this is feedback we're getting is like we understand this. The initial focus is on the FAD, right? Preparedness and so on really being patterned after the poultry industry's H5, H7 program. Um, but what about domestic disease and how can we use it for that? And, and for certain, a platform is agnostic to pathogen, right? And so, so I would expect that there'll be some uh, resolutions and so on coming forward for, for that to be considered, uh, or we're having the, be the, I guess it'd be the fourth house of delegates now, um, this September. And I, I wouldn't be surprised that there'll be some some uh, things come forward there to say, hey, what about domestic diseases, and and should that be something that that looks that looks at uh, uh, be considered within scope of ship as we as we look forward. Agnostic to pathogen, I think, is such an important value proposition of the program. The the pseudo rabies um, eradication gets canonized, and it was very valuable. But we have to also appreciate that it was an event. It was not a program. It was a one time thing for one disease with one set of tools that has not been repeatable across any other pathogens. And um, to that end, we can't rely on that sort of approach. To to have an event is great to solve a crisis. But that's what it does. It solves a crisis. This is a program that can help us facilitate facilitate disease management across fill in the blank number of pathogens in the future. And I think um, uh, it's probably good for us, Roger, to somewhat close with for 
for anybody that's buying what you're selling there that, okay, like this ship thing, maybe I wasn't bought into the foreign animal disease. Maybe it's, I'm, I'm sick of ASF and I don't want to hear about it anymore because I get the fatigue associated with that. Um, but maybe they're thinking, oh, all right, well, if we're going to use this thing for PED and we're going to use this thing for PERS and other domestic diseases, like maybe I should get on board. Like if you're a practitioner or a, a, a producer, anybody in the industry, what message would you have for those individuals? How can they get involved? How can they be part of the building momentum around the ship platform? Sure. Yeah, I, I think for the, the producers, um, my suggestion would be to reach out to your, your veterinarian. Okay. Reach out to your veterinarian, your practicing veterinarian, your herd veterinarian as a source of information. Okay. And because they are probably likely going to be aware and this is what it is and a little bit about how it works and so on. And then there's a, there's what's called an official state agency within each state. Okay. And that your official state agency, and it's generally, it's been, it's at one of two places that U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan official state agency in most states is being housed with under the umbrella of the state animal health official, the Department of Ag, Board of Animal Health, okay, uh, or it is at the producer association, one of those two entities. And, um, and, and obviously, each of the, the producer associations within their respective state would be well-versed of with uh, who that is and where they are. So I think for producers, I would say your local veterinarian and then your minimally your state producer association because the, the, and they would direct you to the right spot. But the U.S. SHIP, because that's it's a it's a national program. OK, so national program, common standards across states and so on being derived, the standards themselves being derived from the from the uh, the uh, participants themselves via the democratic process. But it's executed um state by state okay and that's very much the same way the npip thing is is that it's a national program but how each state goes about it um really kind of takes a little bit i would say of a local flavor of their state the size and scope of the industry the composition of the industry in their respective states and 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 nobody knows um their their uh, things better than local you know so it's kind of a locally based but national program but but administered and and uh, and so on locally very good roger i can't thank you enough for uh being a part of this uh, special episode um you've been very gracious with your time today and you've been gracious with your time through throughout all the opportunities that we've had to interact together um and you're a very humble guy um you, you probably have lots of people say thank you but please know that it is very much deserved um I, there's a quote i love that gets attributed to the late bob morrison do work that matters right there's a lot of people in our industry that like to bitch about problems that we can't do anything about. And you have always tackled things that we can influence, things that we can make better. And I think that's really a great way to kind of wrap up our, our discussion today is, um, you know, fo follow the example, Roger, that you're laying out for all of us. Look at what you can influence. And for sure, the SHIP program is something you can help to influence our industry to uh, a better place. And Roger, for your contributions to that, thank you so much. And uh, please take that as positive reinforcement, which means you can't stop contributing anytime soon. You got to keep doing that same stuff. Okay. No, thanks, Clayton. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming on the show, Roger. To our audience, thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Thanks for joining us on our, our special edition here. Um, please check out the website if you haven't. Um, if you've been a, an active listener to the podcast, if you've been involved in the first 100 episodes, thank you. Um, can't uh, tell you that enough. And uh, encourage somebody else to listen in. If you, if you like this episode, pass it along to somebody, forward it, um, tell somebody about it. Um, it's really uh, through, through your listenership that we're able to keep doing this. For Dr. Roger Main, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great rest of your week. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E. N-E-T 
ix.com.